whether they're struggling with alcohol use disorder, opioid use disorder, whether their marriage is on the fritz, or whether they are you know, have clinical depression and have no motivation or energy to do anything in life, strategic intervention was designed to, to help bring people to not only breakthroughs and transformations, but to bring them there much more quickly than some of the other systems out there. Thanks for tuning in to the Elevation Recovery Podcast, your hub for addiction recovery strategies, hosted by Chris Scott and Matt Finch. Welcome to the show. Super glad you joined Papaya and I today because we've got a really phenomenal topic that can help you to either quit drinking and stay sober from alcohol, overcome drug dependence or drug addiction, or literally change any other undesired behavior that you want. The strategy that we're going to share with you today, I guess I'm going to share it with you because Papaya is my kind of moral support and peaceful, loving kindness energy, but I think I'm going to be sharing the strategies. So What you're going to learn about is something called strategic intervention, which is one of the coaching programs that I'm certified in, well, coaching systems. And strategic intervention was developed by a combination of two people. One, Anthony Robbins, the self-help personal transformation guru that, you know, millions of people have been helped by over the span of probably close to four decades, somewhere around there by now. And Chloe Madonis who is one of the world's most renowned and famous marriage and family therapists. So they both created this system together, which is designed to create transformational breakthroughs, to literally come into somebody's life, whether they're struggling with alcohol use disorder, opioid use disorder, whether their marriage is on the fritz, or whether they are you know, have clinical depression and have no motivation or energy to do anything in life. Strategic intervention was designed to to help bring people to not only breakthroughs and transformations, but to bring them there much more quickly than some of the other systems out there. For instance, strategic intervention is a very eclectic, complex blend of, I believe, more than a dozen different modalities, therapies, disciplines, things like hypnosis, neuro-linguistic programming, positive psychology, goal achievement and systems theory, Uh, the personal science and art of success and achievement, and a bunch of other things that I can't even remember right now because this model of coaching and transforming just has so many elements into it. And the main concept you're going to learn today within this strategic intervention system is called neuroassociative conditioning, that is NAC, not to be confused by the supplement that Chris Scott and I often talk about on this show, N-acetylcysteine not that NAC. Today's NAC is neuroassociative conditioning. So we can break that down right now. Neuro, that refers to brain. Associative, that refers to the associations that you link up to a person, place, or thing in your brain. And conditioning, think about strength conditioning. You're conditioning your strength, mindset conditioning. So it's kind of like making this a habit, wiring it in your brain, and having it totally shift you when you embody this. And to kind of frame this neuroassociative conditioning, so to speak, I guess we could call it framing it, we have to back up a little bit and look at it through the lens of something called the pain pleasure principle, the PPP or the P P cubed. You may have noticed if you've ever taken a physiology class like in high school or college, or have just studied physiology on your own, that humans are quite complex specifically our brains, but even our systems as well, the central nervous system, obviously the brain, the endocrine system, and much more. We are very complex mind-body-spirit systems, or mind-body-spirit complexes, you could say. And what you might find really interesting is that despite how complex our brains are, how complex our mind-body-spirit complexes are, well, all human behavior, when you boil it down to it, comes from a few things. Number one, our innate survival-based needs to both avoid pain and to gain pleasure. So moving away from pain and moving towards pleasure. So that is, in a nutshell, the pain-pleasure principle. Everything we do in life is either to avoid pain or to gain pleasure or a combination of both of those. And to give you some examples of this, let's think about kind of everyday life. For example, For a person that is struggling with alcohol use disorder and has not been able to overcome the disorder on their own or even with professional treatment or peer support 
or 12-step groups, it might be because of their pain-pleasure principle. It's kind of a a fun word to say, pain-pleasure principle. Try to say that 10 times fast. No thanks. So here's this example. When I first started drinking alcohol, well, I guess the first time I ever drank it, I was 14 years old. I was a freshman in high school, and I was pre-partying. It was uh, my older brother from another mother is 10 years older than me. So my buddies were both 14. It was myself at the age of 14 and two of my friends, all age 14. And we went to a party with my older brother from another mother and a bunch of his friends that were all, you know, around the ages of 23 to even like 30 and above, I believe. And this party was a like a pre-party before we went to a concert where we were going to see Candlebox, Suicidal Tendencies, and then the closing main band, Metallica. This was going to be my second time seeing Metallica live. The first time I ever saw him was the year prior, and I was watching Metallica and Guns N' Roses and Body Count at the old Jack Murphy Stadium here in San Diego, California. I was offered alcohol, as were my friends when we got to this party, and I had never drank before. But I said, yeah, I'll have some alcohol. Are you kidding me? I'm hanging out with the the old dudes now. Let's do this. And so what I noticed was the alcohol went down really, really smoothly. I loved the taste of it. I loved how it made me feel euphoric. It made me finally feel super confident. At the age of 14, I don't think I had ever felt confident, ever felt comfortable in my own skin. And I'll tell you, as I was probably 110 pounds at that age. I was a shrimp. I didn't hit my growth spurt until I was in my early 20s. But I drank six beers, likely in the span of, you know, maybe less than two hours. That's how fast and smooth and easy those ice cold bottles of beer were going down. After all the beer ran out, uh, somebody said that there was some liquor in the freezer in a flask and that I could have some. I was like, sure. By that point, I wasn't blacked out, but I was kind of uh, graying out, I guess you could call it. Went in there and I started drinking from the flask. Five minutes later, I'm sitting on the couch and I'm noticing that I'm having this great conversation with the girl that was probably 21 or 22, probably one of uh, my brother's friends, girlfriends. And I just felt so confident. It was just so easy to talk to a member of the opposite sex under the influence of six beers on an empty stomach and a few shots of whatever type of liquor that was. I think it was scotch, in fact. The only problem was, as we got stuck in big time traffic on the way to the concert, so many people were going to this concert, there was thousands and thousands and thousands of people, and in this probably two, two and a half hours of traffic, I became violently ill. I was uncontrollably vomiting, and I was vomiting, I couldn't even get my head out the window of my brother's car. I was, well, I guess it was his, then at the time, wife's car that he was driving. So I couldn't even put my head out the window. I was so weak and so sick and so drunk and so dizzy and so nauseous. And I began puking into my hands and vomiting into my lap. And I'll never forget my friend Joe uh, back at the time, one of my good friends, Joe. He said that, and and I remember this somewhat, but he said that I turned back because I was in the front seat sitting shotgun. He said, I turned back, looked at him, just looking pathetic as can be, and I had vomit trickling down my lip that didn't make it all the way off my mouth. And he said that I went like this, I puked, and like just looked all depressed and sad. And of course, he and our other friend there, forget his name, they just started cracking up and laughing. So in the middle of all this traffic, we weren't going anywhere at many times, and my brother was flying out of the car and running to each car that he saw, asking people if they had any paper towels, any type of thing that he could use to help wipe up this growing and growing pile of puke that was all over me, all over my sister-in-law at the time, her car. It was just disgusting. Oh boy, what what a nightmare. So that was my first time drinking and getting drunk and getting, you know, totally sick from it. And not being able to control my drinking from the very first time ever, I couldn't drink just one. I couldn't drink just two. Again, I was a shrimp. I was probably five foot three inches at 14 as a male, you know, 105 or 10 pounds soaking wet. 
and here I am drinking a six-pack to the dome in a short amount of time, more than a lot of adults drink in two hours. That is how I knew that, oh my goodness gracious. Well, I didn't know it back then, but looking back at it with hindsight that's 2020, I sure was uh, kind of primed for alcohol addiction, for alcohol cravings, and not being able to stop after that very first drink. So after my first time drinking alcohol, getting drunk, blacking out, getting sick, having a hangover, I probably didn't drink any alcohol for at least a year. In fact, all the way through high school, ever since that first time drinking, which made me so sick, vomiting, just totally out of control, dizzy, I didn't really care about it, you know? And when I was 15, I started to smoke uh, cannabis, and then I started to smoke quite a lot of cannabis, and I was too busy surfing and bodyboarding and downhill skateboarding and riding my bike and playing hacky sack and playing video games and hanging out with friends and watching surf videos and going to the store and renting VHS videotapes and hanging out with friends and family. And I just didn't care about drinking all throughout high school, even when I was 18, 19, 20. I didn't care about it. Now, I would drink from time to time during the years from, you know, 15 to, you know, 20, leading up to my 21st birthday. But I wasn't a big drinker, and I rarely got drunk, and it was almost never my idea. The closer I got to 21, sometimes I'd get the idea that I wanted to drink a 40 or wanted to drink a 24-ouncer. But, you know, never like these huge quantities. So it was always, you know, friends of mine, this one friend, Zach, and I had some other friends, too, that their parents would go out of town. And so we'd have a sleepover at their house and we'd drink vodka and orange juice, you know, screwdrivers with saltine crackers, or we'd drink car bombs or we'd drink other things. And it always made me feel crappy. Alcohol never made me feel good. I always felt sick the next day. You know, I, for, I just didn't like it. It was my body telling me from all the very first years that I consumed alcohol, that's not a good substance for me for whatever reason. Maybe it's my background. I've got uh, Native American genes and Irish genes and Pennsylvania Dutch and some other ones. And a lot of these can be very, very uh, even allergic to alcohol and prone to alcohol addiction and the negative aspects of alcohol. That all changed when I turned 21. And even more specifically, when I turned 22, I got a new friend group. I was selling weed, and I came across this group of friends. They were really fun. We had a lot of the same interests. They were always partying. They always had a lot of girls over at their apartment. They lived a half block away from me. I was a 22-year-old, uh, mostly marijuana dealer at the time with my home-based uh, part-time business selling pot. So I didn't have a, a real job, and I had to, got to choose my own hours. So the, one of the results of that was I could drink all the time if I wanted to. And then at that point, with how much fun I was having with those friends, then the more I drank alcohol, remember before, every time I drink alcohol, you know, every few months or something like that, probably on the average from the time I was 15 to maybe 20, 21, it was never more than, you know, maybe every month or three months that I drank alcohol. And so, you know, and it would make me sick. Remember that changed when I started drinking consistently a few nights a week, and then it turned into four or five nights a week, and then it turned into drinking during the days sometimes. The more I drank alcohol, the better it made me feel, and the more I became to need alcohol to even feel good at all. So in a way, it started to monopolize my brain chemistry, meaning before, naturally, alcohol didn't make me feel good from the first time I consumed it, and then on and on and on course those times I was usually drinking too much but you know it just wasn't a good mixture for me personally but when I started to do it consistently very regularly my brain started to change I started to love it need it and then eventually I I was so addicted to it and physiologically dependent that if I didn't consume alcohol uh, for a day or even a half day I was going to go into delirium tremens I could risk death and so that is what we're going to talk about now. From the year of 22 onward, when alcohol started to make me feel great, alcohol-induced energy, alcohol-induced confidence, alcohol-induced euphoria, alcohol-induced uh, social confidence and relationship confidence and dating confidence, 
alcohol-induced, you know, egocentrism and narcissism, alcohol-induced creativity. Uh, alcohol gave me so many benefits back then. And at that age, 22, 23, 24, typically I didn't get hangovers. I could just drink so much alcohol, especially 22 and 23. We would drink all day sometimes. The next morning I'd wake up feeling great. I'd clean my apartment. I'd go surfing or I'd go sell some weed. And so during that point, and it was helping me to hook up with girls and, you know, that was really cool because without alcohol, I didn't have confidence to be able to do that. I actually had a lot of fear and shyness and low self-esteem. So as you probably have heard in the AA meetings, if you've ever been there, alcohol did for me what I could not do for myself, or at least what I did not do for myself, did not know how to do for myself, had not figured out how to do for myself at that point. So coming back to the pain pleasure principle, the thing that drives all human behavior, during the ages of 22 and 23, that kind of period especially, I got a 10 out of 10 pleasure from drinking. Okay, so now coming to the neuroassociative conditioning part. Neuroassociations, let's talk about that. Everything we do is to either avoid pain or to gain pleasure. And then, well, how does that work? The, how your brain views a person, place, or thing. In this case, what my brain associated to me consuming alcohol was a 10 out of 10 pleasure. Why? I just previously mentioned it. Alcohol-induced energy, confidence, uh, social lubricant, to be able to hook up with girls, to be able to feel euphoric and energized and confident and bold. And it would literally do for me it would make me this person that I normally wasn't. It w I was normally not a confident, outgoing, you know, badass dude. Alcohol made me at least believe that I was that person. And then again, I wasn't getting hangovers. I was not getting hangovers. At that age, with such a healthy liver, and I was exercising a lot, surfing and bike riding and skateboarding and hacky sack and other forms of exercise as well, body surfing, swimming, and weightlifting sometimes. So I would say that during the ages of 22 and 23, I linked a 10 out of 10 pleasure to the behavior of drinking alcohol. And I probably linked a one or maybe a two out of 10 pain to the behavior of drinking alcohol. I wasn't getting many negative consequences. You know, I, of course I would do some things that w I'd be really shameful about, felt a lot of guilt over, you know, did some, some bad stuff. But overall, I didn't really care. I was in my early 20s. I was a, a marijuana dealer. So I wasn't too concerned with being a good person. You know, I was like living through this bad boy phase that was so not who I am in my true self. But it was the social mask that I thought that I needed to wear and be and put on to be able to be accepted by the people that I was hanging out with. And thus, if I was accepted by them, I was loved by them. And so I wasn't thinking any of this consciously, but looking back on it, again, hindsight 2020, and operationally, that's what I was doing. That's how it was playing out. I didn't like who I was as a person. I wasn't okay and secure with myself. And so alcohol helped me to get those feelings of security, those feelings of being good enough, those feelings of being popular, of being good with girls, of being fun, of being outgoing. So for me, Alcohol greatly outweighed, the positive benefits of alcohol greatly outweighed the negative consequences. So my neuroassociations and the kind of unintentional neuroassociative conditioning that I was doing back then was just kind of reinforcing the pleasure from alcohol because it would lead me to having great experiences, great times at the bar, great times at parties, great times at home, hanging out with friends. So many, t time after time, again, every once in a while uh, at that age, I would do something horrible. I, I, I'm not even going to talk about some of the, most of the things I did, but I would do things where I was blacked out drunk and I would just feel so much shame and so much guilt afterward, but those weren't like the regular occurrence at that point in my drinking. It was a lot of fun, a lot of pleasure, a lot of euphoria, a lot of just huge highs and only, you know, a very limited amount of the negative consequences and the low lows. So at that point, 
my neuroassociative conditioning was like, there's no way I'm quitting drinking. Alcohol is great. I love it. So during this time where I was drinking a lot habitually and often daily, my parents and some of my friends were saying, dude, you got a drinking problem or Matt, you're an alcoholic or dude, you have become a full blown alcoholic. Matt, you're a drunk. You're a lush. And, you know, people would say these things, and sometimes I believed them. Most of the time I didn't. But since I, I linked so much pleasure to drinking and not much pain to it, I was, at that point, I was linking and associating more and more pain to drinking. But it, overall, still, it was much more pleasurable than it was painful. So there was no way I was going to quit. Now, so that's an example of having disempowering neuro associations for the goal of quitting drinking the goal of quitting drugs or changing another behavior. So the worst neuroassociation setup you can have for either quitting drinking, quitting drugs, or changing another behavior is if you link a 10 out of 10 level of pleasure to the substance or the behavior, and you link only a 1 out of 10 pain to the substance or behavior. Think about it that way. Your brain associates to alcohol or drugs or another behavior 10 out of 10 pleasure. And your brain associates to alcohol or the drug or another behavior only a 1 out of 10 pain. There's no need to quit at that point, or there might be a need to quit, but you certainly don't see it. So the reason I'm doing these extremes first on this spectrum is because we're working our way to the very middle of this spectrum, which is total ambiguity, which is where a lot of people are stuck in this phase of ambiguity, procrastination, backsliding, slow progress, inconsistency, and other things that we're going to get into. Now let's talk about the best neuro associations to be able to set up intentionally in your brain to be able to quit drinking to be able to overcome a drug addiction, or to be able to change any other behavior in your life. That would be to link a 1 out of 10 pleasure to alcohol or the drug or the behavior, and a 10 out of 10 pleasure to not consuming the substance, alcohol, or engaging in the behavior. So on one side of the spectrum, again, if you link a 10 out of 10 pleasure to the substance or behavior, and a 1 out of 10 pain to the substance or behavior, you're, you're not going to quit. There's going to be no need to quit, at least in your mind. Even if like somebody offers you a bunch of money, it would probably be hard to do. Well, I guess it depends on how much money that would be. And then, so that's one side of the spectrum. Quitting is pretty much not even something you're thinking about, let alone something that you're going to go out and do. Then on the opposite side of that spectrum, when we go all the way to the other side of the spectrum, we've got you link a 10 out of 10 pain to the substance or the behavior and only a 1 out of 10 pleasure. At that point, you want to quit so bad. You're just like, and that's the best neuro associations to have. 10 out of 10 pain to drinking or drugs or the behavior, 1 out of 10 pleasure to it. When you have that type of neuro conditioning going on up there, that makes quitting that makes changing a behavior so much easier, such a smoother process. Everything just seems to get out of your way. You can knock over obstacles, go around barriers, figure out shortcuts, learn more resources, become more resourceful. Things just have like this magical way of cruising in the fast lane to your goal with those neuro associations. Here's the problem. Most people don't even know what their neuro associations are. Most people have been going through life not knowing about the pain, pain pleasure principle, not knowing about NAC, neuroassociative conditioning, and thus being more of a victim of their environment and conditioning regarding getting addicted to alcohol, getting addicted to drugs, getting addicted to smartphones, Netflix, pornography, all sorts of things, foods, comfort foods, sugar. There are so many things, bad habits, undesired habits, that, you know, a little bit in moderation is not problematic. But then when people get to the point where they have an addiction, which is continued use despite significant negative consequences in areas like your relationships, your health, your finances, your career, your spirituality. So that's addiction, continued use of a substance or behavior despite significant negative consequences. So now let's move into the very middle of this spectrum, kind of the, the balance point. So let's, let's do a numerical system. It goes from zero in the middle, 
and then on the left side it goes to 10 that is 10 out of 10 pain and a 1 out of 10 pleasure to the behavior or substance other side of the spectrum plus 10 that is you link a 1 out of 10 pleasure to the substance or behavior and a 10 out of 10 pain to it well going to the middle of this spectrum we have the zero point in that zero point you are linking in your brain associating a 5 out of 10 pain to drinking or using drugs or another behavior and a 5 out of 10 pleasure so that they balance each other out think about it this way what if in your brain you associate for this example with alcohol with drinking what if you feel like you're getting overall in life a 5 out of 10 pleasure and benefits from drinking alcohol and also a 5 out of 10 negative consequences and pain from drinking alcohol can you start to see how having those that setup of neuro associations a 5 out of 10 and a 5 out of 10 that's right in the middle and I view that as the ambiguity stage when you're getting the exact amount of numerically assigned quantification of both pleasure and, and positive benefits as well as pain and negative consequences that's kind of like, well, what do I do from here? It's, it's, you know, I'm getting just as much pleasure and positive benefits as pain and negative consequences. You know, people aren't thinking these things consciously, but I guarantee you, unconsciously, your brain is always doing this type of mathematical quantification on avoiding pain and gain, gaining pleasure. And that is why we continue so many habits that we'd like to extinguish. It's because our brain is trying to do us a favor to avoid as much pain as possible while gaining as much pleasure as possible. Now that you know the best neuro associations to set up in your brain to quit alcohol or drugs or another behavior, and now that you know the worst neuro associative conditioning set up to have, and now that you know right in the middle of ambiguity that's a 5 out of 10 pain and a 5 out of 10 pleasure to drinking or drugs or another behavior, now we can start to work at how you can actually consciously, intentionally, strategically, step by step, begin to change your neuro associations regarding how much pleasure and pain, positive benefits and negative consequences you associate in your brain to alcohol or drugs or another behavior. But right before we move on to some exercises that you can adopt and utilize in your own life, to optimize your neuro associations to help you overcome any type of addiction or any type of bad habit. Let me give you a couple more examples from things that are not related to addiction, or at least not related to alcohol or drug addiction. For example, there was a point maybe around five years ago where I'd become overweight. I wasn't obese. I wasn't morbidly obese. I'm six foot three inches. And at that time, I got up to about 230 pounds. That wouldn't be a problem if it was mostly muscle because I'm so tall. The problem was it was mostly fat. I didn't measure my body fat and uh, my body fat percentage, but I was guessing that I was probably 25 or 30 percent body fat. I was flabby. I had a chubby face. I had a pretty substantial sized belly. My belly was protruding. And you know, when you gain weight, for me, it happened kind of slowly. It wasn't something where, you know, I, I was skinny one day and then the next day you wake up, look in the mirror and you're, you've gained all that weight. No, 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 no. How it happens for a lot of people and how it happened for myself was it was over time. It was over the span of many, many, many months where I just started to overeat. I, it became my coping tool. I was so stressed out during this period of life. You know, this is years after uh, drug and alcohol addiction, but I was going through so much stress, work stress, relationship stress, single parent stress, bills stress, many other types of stress. And one thing that I found was if I ate a bunch of pizza at night after work and followed it by a tub of Ben and Jerry's, that would just conquer my stress. What happens when you indulge in a bunch of comfort foods like that? that are high in carbohydrates, you know, pizza, ice cream, just so high in sugar, simple carbohydrates, as well as, you know, saturated fat and a bunch of other things. But that would bring down my cortisol level. I was abusing simple carbs and overeating carbs 
as well as other things, to lower that cortisol, to be able to r reduce that stress and relax. And by repeatedly doing that over and over again, now all of a sudden, not only did I need those types of foods to relax the stress, but eventually I needed all those junk foods and nasty foods, not in moderation, but in, you know, as my everyday diet, just to be able to feel normal. Because if I tried to eat a salad or, you know, grilled chicken with uh, broccoli and rice or something like that, it didn't sound good. And when I would eat it, it would like, I would start going through sugar withdrawal. I would start going through all these withdrawals of these foods that I was binging on. But I didn't care that I was gaining weight. You know, I didn't look my best, not at all. I didn't feel confident at that weight, not at all. But, I, you know, I was making lots of money at that point, getting a lot of stuff done. And so it was okay. Here is how my neuro associations regarding this type of overeating and choosing the wrong foods and high calorie stuff like pizza and ice cream and California burritos, all sorts of other sweets and, you know, high fat, just really fast food, takeout food and what have you. One day, two things happened in the same day. So I had gone out to breakfast by myself in the morning, got some work done on my phone, and I went out to breakfast at a Mexican restaurant. And I had this huge omelet, giant omelet, bunch of potatoes, and some toast and orange juice. When I left that breakfast re Mexican breakfast restaurant, and I was walking down Newport Avenue uh, in the town right close to me, Ocean Beach, I now live in Point Loma, uh, one of my friends from high school that I hadn't seen in years was driving by in his truck. And I'm walking by myself, walking back to my car. My stomach's just, not only had I gained a bunch of weight and my stomach was big, but remember, I just had all those calories, a ton of carbs, just loaded it all up. So my belly was extra big, extra big. And I hear this out of this, I recognize my friend's truck. You can't, you can't miss it once you know what he drives. And I hear this from the window. You're getting fat, Finch. That's my last name, Finch. That made me feel like shit. It was kind of funny, but then that was the first time that somebody else said something. Remember, when I was looking at my weight every single day, you know, it, it kind of happens slowly. And then you look at yourself so much, you don't realize just how much weight you're gaining. And it's you can lower your standards and start to just be okay with being that weight. When you lower your standards, then, you know, you fall down to where you've lowered your standards. So later on that same day in the evening, I saw another friend and he looked at me. He hadn't seen me in probably a year. He looked at me, uh, looked down at my belly, looked back up at my face, looked down at my belly and pointed down, looked up at my face. And he said, what's going on with that thing, man? That was it. Twice in the same day, I had two of my male friends basically talking some smack about it, like, what are you doing, dude? And at that point, I'm glad that they did that. I'm so glad that they did that. I'm glad that it happened in the same day because what that did was it elevated how much pain I perceived with eating all those foods and overeating and how much pleasure. Immediately from having those two things where people were noticing, they were you know, telling me about it. Obviously, it didn't look good. Now, it wasn't just me that was noticing it. People were noticing it, and they were saying things, and that was making me feel bad about myself, not because you know they said something bad, but because I knew I could do better. I knew that I had done better for so long in the past, and I knew that I had fell down to a place that wasn't my identity. You know, I'm really into health and wellness and passion and energy and focus and eating, eating in that way. You know, I wasn't having those great benefits. So immediately from those two interactions, I linked a 10 out of 10 pain to the behavior of overeating and choosing all those bad foods and in way over amounts. And then I all of a sudden linked a 1 out of 10 pleasure to it immediately. The next day I woke up and my desire to get back to an ideal weight and look good naked was way, way, way stronger 
than my desire to eat pizza and Ben and Jerry's and all these other things to reduce cortisol and reduce stress and, you know, kind of just get euphoric from food basically, which is, which can be used as a drug, which I was doing. Now I'll give you one more example of using neuroassociative conditioning to overcome a habit that you want to break. This example comes from my strategic intervention coaching online training system where Tony Robbins was talking about how he had a client uh, when this was back in the early days of Tony doing his stuff. He had a client that wanted to quit smoking. This guy linked so much pleasure to smoking and he linked some pain to it as well. He mostly wanted to quit because he was smoking like you know two packs a day, something crazy like that. And he didn't want to get cancer, and it was reducing his appetite, side effects. But he loved smoking, and that's why he couldn't stop. So Tony Robbins did something so crazy. I don't do nearly to the extent of his type of strategic intervention. Uh, that guy's kind of a madman, especially back in those days. But what he did was he had this client meet him in a hotel room. So Tony, Rubin, <laughs> Tony Robbins purchased, uh, rented out a hotel room, and he had that guy come up and meet him in the room. And it was a smoking room. This is decades ago. Room where you could smoke. And Tony told him, bring a bunch of packs of cigarettes. So what Tony had him do was he made him smoke a cigarette. And then as soon as he was done with that one, smoke another one. And then he started to have him smoke two cigarettes at a time, back to back, then three cigarettes at a time. And this guy was getting headaches. He was, he was puking. He was getting nauseous. He was like, I, I want to stop. I want to stop. And Tony was getting intense. He was like screaming at him, no, put that in your mouth. And, you know, he's gnarly. He's like probably six, seven. He might even be taller. The dude is a giant. He's a big, huge guy, big, huge hands. And he can be really scary. So he went into acting mode and he was scaring the piss out of this guy. And so this guy had hired him and paid him money and he did want to quit smoking. So he was going along with it. Just so intense. So all of a sudden there's just all this smoke in the room. He's got all these cigarettes in his mouth. Tony's screaming at him. He's got migraine headaches coming on, vomiting. And then he's making him, no, put those cigarettes back in your mouth. And he just berated him and just, so what this did I don't know how long the experience went on for. I think it happened for a few hours, but think about it. He, before this happened, he linked a lot of pleasure, probably a 10 out of 10 pleasure to smoking and who knows how much pain, maybe a two out of 10 pain to smoking, maybe even a five out of 10 pain. But when the pleasure of doing the behavior, in this case, smoking cigarettes is, you know, you know, significantly higher than the pain, even though you want to quit. With that kind of neuro associations going on in your brain, it can be hard, if not impossible, to do. So what Tony did, this kind of strategic intervention that he did using neuroassociative conditioning, he radically altered this gentleman, this client's neuro associations. All of a sudden, he left that hotel room totally traumatized, never wanted to smoke cigarettes again, was just just the thought of smoking a cigarette was disgusting. And then he was able to quit right then. Uh, he didn't want anything to do with cigarettes. Now, I'm not recommending that if you're drinking or using drugs that you should do that too. That's a, you know, I don't even know if it's legal to do that type of stuff nowadays. But my point in sharing that example and the other examples is just to give you kind of more of a baseline and more of a foundation on how this neuroassociative conditioning works. Again, coming back to the pain pleasure principle. Exercise number one is to start off with valuing where you're at right now, meaning how much pleasure do you associate to the behavior that you'd like to change? 10 out of 10, 7 out of 10, 3 out of 10, some other type of number out of 10, and how much pain that you associate with that behavior, with engaging in that behavior, whether it's drinking, taking drugs, or another type of behavior. Do you associate a 10 out of 10 pain to it? A 4 out of 10 pain? 7 out of 10 pain? The reason this is the first exercise is it gives you so much clarity, you know, and it's probably impossible to get it exactly. But what you can do is start to think about, okay, in how I'm living and how I'm engaging in this behavior, operationally, how it's affecting me, you know, what is kind of the consistent amount of pleasure that it's bringing to the table? pleasure and positive benefits, and what is kind of the consistent overall pain 
and negative consequences is bringing. You might, you know, so again, you want a 10 out of 10 pain to using the behavior, engaging in it, and a 1 out of 10 pleasure. If you're not there, don't worry, it's fine, because the next few exercises are designed to help you achieve those empowering neuroassociations. And one thing I can almost guarantee is that after you do this exercise, exercise one, and you look at on down on paper, you can see right in front of your eyes how much pleasure you associate to the behavior you want to change and how much pain you associate to the behavior you want to change. It's going to be right in front of your face where you're at and what you have to work with and which direction you need to go in to get to the empowering neuroassociations that we've talked about. Exercise number two is to write an exhaustive list. Come up with as many items on this list as you can think about. These are ways that you can associate more pain and negative consequences and more overall pain to engaging in the behavior. A lot of times there is a lot more pain than we even know about. We just haven't got a pen and paper out and come up with an exhaustive list to be able to see it right in front of our eyes just how much pain the the behavior is causing in our lives. And if you put on some, you know, background, low-level instrumental music or some other type of music that helps get your creative juices flowing, this can really help you to come up with this totally exhaustive list of just starting the list and not stopping until you can't think of any other thing that you could do to make drinking or make drug use or make another behavior a 10 out of 10 pain. Exercise number three is doing that same one as two, only this time coming up with an exhaustive list of all the things that you could write down, that you could think about, that you could do, the ways you could think and believe that would increase your pleasure of engaging in the behavior to go down to a one out of 10. How can you get that from wherever it is right now down to a one out of 10 pleasure? Because remember, I'm going to be repetitive in this because, you know, kind of the more times you repeat something in a, in a topic like this, the more times it can sink into your subconscious mind so you actually learn this stuff. So again, all these exercises are helping you to, number one, figure out where your neuro associations currently are, how much pain and pleasure you link to the behavior that you're doing that you don't want to be doing. And then to be able to, from that point, figure out all the different things that you can do, that you could do, that you're capable of doing to build as much pain associated with that behavior as possible and to build as much pleasure associated with not engaging in that behavior as possible. One of the biggest reasons people uh, keep relapsing back onto alcohol or keep relapsing back onto opioids is because they don't feel comfortable in their own skin. Or for people on opioids, they've got legitimate chronic pain problems, and opioid therapy is thus far the only thing that has really helped to manage their pain so they can live a much less debilitated life. So another important thing to remember is when it comes to building up more empowering neuro associations to be able to extinguish a behavior that you want to extinguish, what you have to do is, well, you don't have to, but what's often recommended is to replace the behavior that you want to change, drinking, drug use, or another behavior, with one or more alternate behaviors that give you the same or similar benefits to the same or similar level of magnitude of potency, if that makes sense. That's why Chris Scott and I are so big into fitness. You know, think, think about it, fit recovery, fitness. When you exercise, when you get into the habit of regular fitness and exercise and your body just gets to the point where you love it and you thrive on it, you can't wait to go exercise and get that workout in, well, what does that do? That boosts confidence, focus, energy, healthy sleep patterns, makes you more confident because your physique gets better. The more you take control of your health, the healthier your skin can get, you know, the more energy you can have, the more your brain works better, and life can just become easier and easier. And exercise is just one way that you can help to extinguish a behavior that you want to change, whether it's using substances or even something like I was doing, and overeating, you know, overeating. Sugar can be a drug for sure when you abuse it. And so replacing the behavior that you want to change with one or more other behaviors 
that are healthy, that are very adaptive, like exercise, supplementation. You know, for people quitting drinking, there's things like CBD-infused adaptogenic drinks. A lot of people that are quitting prescription opioid painkillers, quitting fentanyl and other fully synthetic, mega-powerful opioids, a lot of them are transitioning over to a natural plant opioid called Kratom or Kratom, or in Thailand, it's pronounced Kratom, because that is a much weaker partial opioid agonist versus a full power, full opioid agonist. So what these people are doing is they're kind of gently going from a really powerful pharmaceutical opioid, whether it's semi-synthetic or fully synthetic, before they're extinguishing that behavior completely, they're transitioning over to a natural partial opioid agonist. And then a lot of them are using that for a while. And then they find that it's much easier to come off of that natural, much less potent plant opioid than it was to come straight off fentanyl or straight off shooting heroin, for example. Then when it comes time to quitting the kratom plant, which is a partial opioid agonist, binds to opioid receptors. People can get crazy addicted to it, especially when they're taking high amounts on a daily basis. But when it comes to that, well, if they try quitting Kratom and they haven't figured out ways to mitigate their pain, for example, without opioid therapy, or if they haven't figured out ways to remedy their proneness to exhaustion or depression without some other type of thing, maybe that can boost their dopamine really high like Kratom, only without the addiction and dependence uh, potential side effects. So, and for quitting drinking, for me, like I, I didn't have any self-esteem, low self-esteem, low self-confidence, um, anxiety, depression, yada, yada, yada. I had a bunch of issues back then. So when I was quitting drinking and quitting opioids, etc., I really had to figure out different ways, non-addictive, healthy ways, adaptive ways to create these new behaviors that would give me the same or similar benefits to the same or, si or similar potency, magnitude. I needed to figure out how to be comfortable in my own skin without drugs and alcohol, how to be confident without drugs and alcohol, how to have high self-esteem without drugs and alcohol, how to manage or preferably transcend anxiety and depressive disorders, and for a phase of my life, bipolar 2 disorder. I had to find healthy, adaptive new behaviors for when I was dating a new girl, in the past I, I relied on and used the crutch of alcohol and pharmaceutical pills like opioids and benzos and Adderall and a bunch of other things uh, to when I was dating girls and when I was you know doing that because under the influence of substances, I felt so much more comfortable in my own skin and thereby making the dating process and the relationship process, transitioning into relationship much more easy for me, even though it was causing negative consequences. You know, it seemed like a good idea at the time because it was like a hack for me. So when I quit everything, I had to kind of rehabilitate and learn how to achieve these desired outcomes that I wanted, how to level up my potential without using the crutch of overconsumption of alcohol, overconsumption of drugs to, to the point where I was at that turned into these severe you know, multiple addictions at a time. So as you're hearing me talk about these topics and we're winding the close of this episode, you could start to think about what are some healthy, adaptive behaviors that you could potentially use to help to replace the current behavior or behaviors that you are trying to or would like to change. So I hope you're starting to really, really see how powerful this system of conscious, intentional, strategic utilization of the pain pleasure principle so you can use it rather than it use you. And that way you can, now that you've learned about neuroassociative conditioning, you can figure out with these exercises, number one, what your current rating of pain and pleasure is to the behavior that you want to change. Number two, how you can get those neuro associations to the highest amount of pain possible to the behavior you want to change and the lowest amount of pleasure possible to the behavior you want to change. And then when you do that and you also have 
other behaviors, alternative healthy and adaptive behaviors that can provide the same or similar benefits to the same or similar magnitude that either alcohol or drugs or another behavior we're supplying you with. Well, now you have got quite a formula, an equation, so to speak, where you can take this, run with it, and achieve all sorts of breakthroughs and transformations and achieve more of your potential than you did prior to listening to this training. With that being said, as always, thank you so much for watching. We love you guys so much, Chris and I and Papaya. Thank you so much for tuning in and can't wait to see you next time.